Well, let me begin this morning by wishing you a happy new year. I know we are in the second week of the year, but this is the first time I'm seeing you for, since last year. And this is the first Sunday. This is the first Lord's Day. This is the first communion day. And in a real sense, this is the first message of this new year. Hallelujah. And I believe, I sincerely believe, it's a message that the Lord wants us all to hear. It's coming out of the book of Revelation. And let me provide some background in preparation for the message here. What we have in verses in, in these chapters, chapters, one and, chapters 2 and 3, are seven letters written to the different churches, seven different churches that existed in Asia Minor in the first century. And these letters could be considered from three different perspectives. First one, they can be viewed prophetically. These churches represent different stages of the church over the last 2,000 years. And in verses 1 to 7, which we will be concentrating on, it's the first letter to the church of Ephesus. And the church of Ephesus represents the time period between the day of Pentecost and AD 100, the first 100 years of the church. Ephesus represents the apostolic church. The word Ephesus means desirable. It was the early church with all the zeal of its first love burning for Jesus Christ. It was a time of great expansion for the early church. They started out with great love for Christ and a burning desire to see souls saved. Sadly, towards the end of the first century, the church had left her first love and began to cool off. Not only could these letters be viewed prophetically, they could be viewed practically. These letters were sent to literal, real congregations that were actually functioning at the close of the first century. And while they were written to real churches existing in that day, they still speak to every church today. Hallelujah. God has a word for deeper life assembly in our message today. They can be viewed prophetically, practically. They can also be viewed personally. These letters spoke to con congregations, but we should be mindful that the Lord has a word for every one of us here today. He has something to say to each and every one of us about our relationship to him. Allow, us, allow me to read Revelation chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou cannot, cannot bear them which are, which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has fainted nevertheless. Sounds like an awesome church, right? Sounds like the ideal church. And as Jesus begins his address to this church, he does so in glowing terms. He commends them for their works and their doctrinal purity. It appears that there was this congregation was a very busy congregation. They were active. And their ministries and their members were occupied in the work of the Lord. And in verse 2, we just read, Jesus uses three words that describe the business of this church. The word works refers to their accomplishments. This was a church that had been used of the Lord to do great things in the community. The word labor literally means a beating. It speaks of intense work, toiling, and pain. The word patience reminds us that they carried about their works for the Lord in the midst of persecution. The city around them hated them for their doctrine and what they were preaching. But this was a working church. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Much like us today. And in verses 2 and 3 and verse down in verse 6, Jesus tells that, that the church was doctrinally pure. 
They stood for the truth and they stood against evil. They publicly exposed the false prophets. They were what we would call an old-fashioned fundamental church. They were, all, they were not allowing the world to influence their worship or their walk. And looking in from the outside, anyone would be, have concluded that they were a rock-solid congregation. Attending their service, anyone would have been in awe at their work and their calendar of activities. But there was someone, someone more important who had an, his eye on this church. The Lord Jesus himself was walking in their midst, but they were unaware of his presence. While they were much, there was much to commend them for, there were some problems in this church. And the Lord knew what the people around them did not know. The Lord knew what the church itself did not know. The Lord knew that this church was just going through the motions of serving him. He knew that they did not love him like they once loved him. Read with me, verse 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. In spite of all that I have just said, in spite of all I have just commended you for, in spite of your labor and your love and your good works, in spite of all the ministry you have, I have somewhat against thee. For you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will remove thy candlestick out of thy place, except thou repent. If this church had been honest about their condition, their favorite hymn would not have been, Oh, how I love Jesus. It would probably be, Oh, how I left Jesus. You see, because Jesus himself accused them. He said, you have left your first love. Instead of singing, oh, how I love Jesus, they may have been singing, oh, how I left Jesus. And this morning, this first Sunday of 24, I want us to consider the Lord's letter to this ancient congregation. You see, what he said to them is relevant for us today. As it was in Ephesus, many in our day are merely going through the motions. Many simply do not love Jesus the way they once did, and it shows. And I want to point out some simple facts that present themselves in this text. I want to preach on the subject, getting back to first love. Getting back to first love. And for our team, it's found right there in verses that we will be concentrating on. Verses 4 and 5. Remember, repent, and return. Remember, said Jesus, and repent. And do the first works again. Return to the first work. I pray the Lord will speak to your heart today and cause you to ask yourself a couple of questions. Do you love him with all of your heart, your soul, and your mind? Are you serving him because it is what you do? Or are you serving him because you are consumed with love for him? Hallelujah. And like I said, our focus is going to be on verses 4 and 5. As I try to preach what I believe the Lord has in this passage for us. I want you to see first the Lord's case against this church in verses 4. After commending them for their works, Jesus condemns them for their lack of love for him. He tells them that there's a real problem in their hearts. And notice the nature of this problem. It is a personal problem. I have somewhat against thee. The Lord of heaven, the Lord of the church, has someone against, somewhat against us. Certainly the church of Ephesus was solid and grounded in faith, in truth. It was a church that was based and built on sound doctrine. They knew what they believed and they practiced it. They were separated, both ecclesiastically as well as personally. Their purity of doctrine and continuance of service was unquestioned. But they had deserted their first love. They had gotten so caught up in duty that they had lost their devotion. 
Their labor was commendable, but their love was contemptible. Like Martha, they were so busy that they had no time for Jesus. Their relationship with Christ was based on performance rather than on passion. They were far so much, so occupied with the work of Christ that they had forgotten the person of Christ. They probably thought that their problem, their biggest problems were the pagan world around them and the persecution that they were facing. But Jesus tells them that the biggest problem they faced was a personal problem with the Lord himself. This is a reminder to us that the Lord cares about his people. If he did not have his eye on them, he would not have been aware of their situation. And I want to say to you today that the Lord is aware of us. Amen. In verse 1, he tells them that he walks among them. The Lord is walking in our midst today, church. In verse 2, he tells them, I know thy works. He knows of our works. He knows us. And he knows us far better than we know ourselves. And no one in the church of Ephesus would have ever guessed that there was a problem between them and Jesus. But it was there. And most of us, we look at ourselves and we think that we are all right. And the problem with our way of gauging our self-righteousness and our state of righteousness is that we compare ourselves with others. And notice we don't compare ourselves with people who are living more holy than us. We compare ourselves with people who are less holy than us. But God's standard is different. God's standard of holiness is higher than that. God's standard of holiness is Jesus himself. Yeah. Hallelujah. And we think our biggest problems are society and government. The truth is our biggest problem in the modern church is that we, like Ephesus, have offended a holy God. Yeah. Hallelujah. We, he has a problem with us, with us because he, we are not where he wants us to be. It is a personal problem between us and the Lord. Not only is it personal, there was a passion problem. Jesus tells them exactly what they have done to offend him. He says, you have left your first love. He tells them that they don't just love him like they used to love him. And while the words of that, all the works, every word in that, in that sentence screams for our attention, there are two words there that are demanding that we look at them. They are the words left and the word first. The word left is an expressive word that means to send away. It was used of a husband who divorced his wife. It means also to expire, to let alone, to omit, to forsake, to abandon, to disregard. Jesus is talking to a people who have walked away from their love for him. They have abandoned his love. They have forsaken his love. They have disregarded his love. Like a man divorcing his wife, they have symbolically sent him away. And the word first there means first in rank of importance. Yes, they still love their church. Yes, they still love their doctrines. They love their activities. They love their busy schedule. They loved all else that they were doing. The one thing that they didn't love, they just didn't love Jesus more than all of these other things. And we might think that falling out of love with Jesus is a minor thing. We might think that it is something that happens to a lot of people and it's not a big deal. We might think that it's something that we can get fixed at the next revival or the next service. But let me tell you, let me show you why falling out of love is such a with Jesus is such a serious thing. You see, when we do not love Jesus, we are in violation of the first greatest commandment. It says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart and with all of thy soul and with all of thy mind. And then when we are not loving Jesus as we ought to, it opens up us to great sin because when we do not love him as we should, we are more likely to break the first four commandments. Amen. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make any graven images. Thou shalt not take the, Lord, the name of thy Lord thy God in vain. Thou shalt remember the Sabbath day. These all pertain to the Lord. And when we don't love the Jesus, how are we loving those? We are 
going to break them every time. Hallelujah. Thou shalt have no other gods but me. Yet we have made so many gods in our lives. Hallelujah. When we do not love Jesus, we should. We, should, we are more likely to violate the other six commandments. Because they said, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love is the fruit of the Spirit. Love for others is the result of our love for God. Gee, the, the, the scripture says, John said, how can you say you love God who you cannot see when you don't even love the people you can see? <laughs> Hallelujah. When we are not loving others as ourselves, we break all of the rest of the commandments. Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not be a false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not commit. All of these things, when we are not loving our neighbors, we are prone to break them. When we do not love Jesus as we should, we will not have a desire to be with him. Do you remember that honeymoon love? Hallelujah. Always wanting to be near and close to that object of your affection. Do you remember... Oh, that's how it was used. It used to be when you were a new believer. But over time, that love has faded and the desire to be around Jesus has become weak and that has faded too. What is the problem? It can all be traced back to our having left our first love. When we do not love Jesus as we should, we will not serve him as fervently as he wants us to. You are going to attend church, but you will not be faithful. You might say we are saved, but how very, very infrequently you will even share your faith with others. You might teach a class, preach a sermon, lead a prayer meeting, lead a Bible study, but there is always going to be something lacking because you are not in love with Jesus. Fervent, emotional, extravagant love for Jesus will always manifest itself in active, public, public service of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And there is much more I can say that could be said about the dangers of love, Jesus, not loving Jesus. And many of us know we have been in that place where we were consumed with love for him. And many of you know now that you are not there. Hallelujah. And we both know, we all know what the difference, we all know what pleases the Lord. We all know what he needs from us. We need to get back there. There's a charge to the church. Notice also in verse 5 that the Lord calls the church. Having addressed their problem, Jesus gives them a plan of action. He tells them how they can go about rekindling the flames of passion for him that once burned in their lives. He calls them to remember. He says, remember therefore, for whence thou art fallen. The Lord's command to them and to us this morning is to look back. Hallelujah. They needed to remember the time when their love for him was powerful and all consuming. And it was the most important thing in their lives. They needed to remember those holy days of salvation when the love of God for them was overwhelming. They needed to remember how it felt to be saved and to know that all their sins had been forgiven. They needed to remember what it felt like to know that they were no longer dead in sin, but that they had been made alive in Jesus Christ. They needed to remember the excitement that every new revelation from the word of God brought to their hearts. And I say to you this morning, church, you and I need to remember also the Christians in Ephesus had fallen. But notice with me, they had not committed adultery. They did not commit murder. They did not commit murder, uh, um, robbery. Yet God said they had fallen. What a note of seriousness. It is a terrible fall for a Christian to become so occupied and busy that his love for Christ fails. I tell you, no child of God who falls into that situation will recover. They were commanded to reflect upon the precious relationship they once had. Do you know what we Christians need today? We need to slow down. We need to remember what Christ has done for us. Do you remember those wonderful honeymoon days 
when you were first saved? Do you remember what it was like when you first got saved? You couldn't get enough of Jesus. You were always in your Bible study regularly. You were in your Bible morning and evening. You were in every prayer meeting. You were in every church service. You hung around and you fellowship with God's people. How is it that you cannot skip, you can skip church and it doesn't bother you? How is it that you can go through life without witnessing? When you first got saved, you wanted to tell everybody you couldn't be quiet. They had to shut you up. Because you loved the Lord. Hallelujah. But you have left your first love. How sad. Unlike the church at Ephesus for many Christians, honeymoon is over. I say you need to start back. Hallelujah. You need to get back there in that honeymoon love and love the Lord. God is calling us to remember. He's calling us to repent. Once they remembered what, they had, what he had done for them, they would see how far they have fallen. I say the same thing to you, church. Remember what the Lord has been to you, what he has done for you. Because it's only when you remember, then you would see how far you are from where, you are, where he wants you to be. Amen. When they remember, they would recognize their sins. They would repent. The word repents there means a change of mind that leads to a different direction, a change in action. When they saw the depths of their sin, they were to turn from it and fall in love with Jesus again. Oh, how I love Jesus. Hallelujah. You see, the greatest need of the modern church for us is to once again fall in love with Jesus. But before we can do this, we have to recognize that our lack of love for him is a sin. Our lack of love for the Lord is a sin. And we have to come to terms with that. And we have to understand that all the things we have allowed to come between us and him are idols. We must inwardly grieve, be grieved and ashamed for our sinful decline. We must endeavor to revive and recover that first zeal, that tenderness, that seriousness, that love for Jesus. We must pray earnestly and watch diligently as when we first set out, when we were first saved. Hallelujah. The modern day church doesn't really need a revival. And the modern day church doesn't need more money, more recognition in society, or more, more, more presence in the community. The modern day church simply needs to fall in love with Jesus all over again. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. You see, because when we repent of our sin and return from that lack of love, we will fill us with his presence. He will fill us with his wonder and he will fill us with his power and everything in the church will fall in place. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So he calls on us to repent. And he says also, do against the first works. He calls us to return. The word first here is the same as the first the word first in, in, in verse 4. And it speaks of first in rank and importance. In other words, Jesus is calling them to return to the things that are most important. The Lord's call here was for the church to return to the simple fundamentals of faith. It was a call to return to the altars of prayer. It was a call to return to his word. It was a call to return to the place of worship. It was a call to return to obedience to his will. It was a call to return to walk in holiness before the Lord. Jesus is still calling. Yes. Hallelujah. He is still calling on the church to return to these basic fundamental foundational activities. And if we are not seeking him in prayer if we are not seeking to feed on his word, if we are not active in his worship, if we are not walking in holiness and obedience, then it shows that we are not in his business. It shows that we do not love him. And if we are not going to do these things, he, we cannot expect him to bless us. If we are not going to do these things, we cannot expect him to move in power amongst us when we gather in his house. But if we love him, we will do these things. These things will be a natural result of our love for him. Oh, Hallelujah. You, you, you want to see souls change? 
you just fall in love with Jesus all over again. And let that love be seen. Hallelujah. You want to see the power of God here at Deeper Life Assembly? You just fall in love with Jesus and let him see that. Let, you, let that see in, be seen in your life every day. And you will begin to see how the Lord is going to move in our midst. You're going to begin to see how we are going to get souls saved. You're going to begin to see the power of the Lord in the kingdom, in the, in the house of God. You just need to fall in love. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. I keep on falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. The Lord gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between my Lord and I. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. That must be the theme of our life. That must be the anthem of our days that we would fall in love with him. Every day, over and over and over and over again. Hallelujah. Oh, see, because when we you can recapture that fervent and emotional, extravagant first love for the Lord, all is going to be well. It will transform us forever as children of God and the church. Our problem in the modern church, our problem at DLA is that we no longer love Jesus as we used to. And if we were honest, we would have to sing like the Ephesians, Oh, how I have left Jesus. May that never be a song that we would sing. Hallelujah. May Jesus never accuse us of leaving him. Hallelujah. So the Lord lays a charge against the church. He brings a call to the church. But I want you to see he always bring, he also brought a challenge to the church. In verse 5, the latter part, because the Lord loves his church, he lets them know that their lack of love for him holds serious consequences down the road. If they stay that course and refuse to repent, they face a certain judgment. And the Lord describes the judgment in, the, in verse 5, the last part. He says, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will remove thy candlestick out of its place. They are challenged concerning an abrupt judgment. The Lord says he will come quickly. That means without delay. He is telling the church when judgment comes, it will come swift and it will come sure. The Lord will not, let me say this again. The Lord will not tolerate deadness and lack of love among the people of his church. Amen. Hallelujah. He will not tolerate that. Sin will be judged and we can be sure of that. Not only are they challenged concerning an abrupt judgment, they are challenged concerning an awful judgment. Listen to what he said. He tells them, I will remove thy candlestick out of its place. That means that they will cease to exist as a congregation. Jesus is telling the church at Ephesus that their lack of love is so serious that it threatens the very existence of their church. And that prophecy was literally fulfilled, fulfilled in Ephesus. There is nothing there today where that great city once stood. There is no Christian church there. There is no Christian witness there. There is no light of the gospel there. The land is inhabited by, by nomad Muslims. And all that as a result of a church that failed to stay in love with Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. What am I saying to you, church? That the love of Jesus is so important to us that we need to rethink where we are. Just look around today. Everywhere. There are little struggling churches with a handful of aged believers. Many of those churches are in their present condition because somewhere along the way, they stop loving Jesus. They stop being passionate about their witness. They stop the all-consuming love. And when they did, their worship became lifeless and dead. Their preaching lost its power and its effectiveness. Many of them are now cold and dead and dried up. 
Many of them once great lighthouses for the Lord. Now they are no longer existing. Their doors have been shut. Their light and their testimony has been snuffed out. Regardless of what you may think, it can happen right here in DLA. And I pray that it wouldn't. But I can see some of the signs already. And you can too if you would look closely. That is why I believe the Lord gave me this message to bring to the church this first day of the new year. And if anybody in DLA is going to repent and turn to Jesus, if anybody is going to seek him and repent of not loving him and fall in love with Jesus again, it's most likely going to be those of you who care enough to come out here on a Wednesday night. When you would come out and join us in prayer. When you would come out and join us in Bible study. When you would come back, come out and dedicate your life to new and fresh to Jesus. When you are going to come out and show him that you do love him. And his ministry means more to you than anything else. Hallelujah. And they are challenged concerning an unavoidable, unavoidable judgment. I don't want Jesus to take away our candlestick, but he will. If our light ceases to shine. The Ephesian church was told that they could avoid their fate if they repented of their sins. Oh, church, hear me, church. The modern church is dying. We all know that. She is dying because she doesn't love Jesus like she used to. And the word of God says the only remedy is repentance and restoration. The only remedy is that we remember where we have fallen from. And that we would repent. And that we would return. And we would do the first works like Jesus said. And we would love him again. And you. Hallelujah. It is a serious thing when a church ceases to love the Lord. That church could wander off into apostasy, and many have and many do. And more than likely, that church will simply fade away and cease to exist. Attendance at many churches have declined drastically, especially after COVID. COVID has become the big excuse of the church. And the restrictions of COVID have been lifted and relaxed, but so many people still continue to stay away. And we question why this is happening. I believe it is because many people no longer love Jesus like they used to. They got a recess from church and their love faded. They got a recess from church and their love grew cold. The word of the Lord this morning is calling us and telling us and accusing us of not loving Jesus the way we should. Our Lord has warned us in the last days. He says, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. How about you, church? Have you lost your first love? Are you still in love with Jesus? Are you just coming to church and serving him because this is duty? Or are you serving because you love him? Hmm. Do you love him? Do you love him with all of your heart and your soul and your mind? Is everything that you do containing to your worship and your service and your come to church part of you loving him? The divine accusation is that you have left your first love. And the divine call is that we would remember and repent and return. I sincerely believe the Lord has spoken to us today. We need to listen to what he is saying. It is time for us to remember and repent and return. If we do not do it, for sure, Jesus says, I will come quickly and I will remove your candlestick. If we do not repent and return to the love of Christ, we stand the risk of being removed. He that had an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Lord, help us to hear. Help us to hear what you are saying. Help us to see that we have wounded your heart by removing our love from you. Help us to see, Lord, 
that we have done so much that is far away from what you have called us to do. Love you. Love you. Love you. We confess that we have not loved you the way we should, Lord. And this day, this first day of this first Sunday of the new year, Lord, we are taking time. We are taking time to renew our love, Lord, to rededicate, to give ourselves again unto you anew, to refresh, to restore the things that are lost, the things that have grown cold. Oh, Lord, in the name of Jesus, help us. Help us. Amen.